right, we are moving on from characterization via optical microscopy or visible light um, to analysis via x-rays. And uh, we've talked a little bit about x-ray analysis in uh, previous lectures, and uh, we talked a bit about x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Um, this next series of lectures is going to focus mainly on x-ray diffraction. And so um, this will be the topic of uh, for the next couple of weeks in class. Uh, when you go up to someone on uh, the street and ask them, hey, how do scientists use x-rays? Uh, most people think of an x-ray radiograph, uh, similar to this one I'm showing here. And uh, I had many moons ago, my son, when he was smaller, he actually had fallen and uh, fractured his finger. And you can kind of see uh, the fracture here. Um, this is an example of using uh, x-rays and uh, you have to use contrast to interpret the image or interpret uh, the data basically which what you're getting or the output of the instrument and in this case the x-ray um, will pass through the human body and go onto a recording plane and in the olden days it was photographic paper uh, this, these days it's pretty much a digital sensor uh, one thing I need to kind of point out is that this is actually a negative image. And so if I have a bunch of x-rays um, going through an area, um, it's going to develop the photographic paper and turn it black. So the area that was, that it was blocked or where the x-rays were blocked, like by my ring here, um, no x-rays actually pass through. And so the image actually looked like this. And so this is a positive image. The x-rays were blocked by higher Z materials, uh, were carbon-based life forms the last time I checked. And so this is silver and steel, uh, which are higher Z uh, than uh, what we're made of. And bones are calcium. Okay, so calcium higher Z than carbon. And so the bones actually block some of the x-rays. And where the x-rays pass through, you can interpret. And uh, it's arguable um, this actual positive image might actually be a uh, little better way to interpret um, the uh, results of the radiograph, basically. Um, this uh, next series of lectures is uh, we're going to talk about uh, some background pertaining to x-rays. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, brief crystallography. I'm, I'm hoping you guys are old hands at it. And um, x-ray diffraction, uh, which again is the kind of the overall topic of, uh, of what we're discussing now. Um, x-ray diffraction and x-ray diffractometer basically outputs a line on a screen. And so this is an example of where we have to teach ourselves to interpret a line on a screen rather than contrast uh, to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, X-rays, uh, I always uh, try to go into the history of some of this stuff. And uh, so they were discovered in 1895 by Wilhelm Rotengen. Um, they were named X-ray because the nature was unknown. And um, forgive the poor punctuation, shouldn't have a period there. Uh, Rotengen actually realized uh, these rays behaved as light. And there's some legend uh, behind it. So in Germany, um, all X radiation is called Rotengen radiation. And so they always pay homage to uh, Wilhelm. And uh, outside Germany, it's gen generally called X rays. Um, he, again, he uh, realized they behaved as light. Um, they affected uh, photographic film. Um, we may talk about this a little bit more later. Um, it's, they're different uh, in that they could actually penetrate wood. So, visible light, you can't really penetrate wood. Uh, he figured out they could penetrate the human body and uh, metal. And so early metallurgists actually used uh, X-ray radiography uh, to look for flaws in steel as used on bridges. And it was actually an early form of non-destructive testing and way long time ago, actually, 1895. That's, that's quite a bit. Um, so again, they were utilized immediately to uh, image the inside of the human body and other non-transparent radi uh, non-transparent objects. And again, the uh, example metallurgists uh, were using it to inspect a bridge steel, basically, and that's uh, kind of the advent of radiography. Um, very interesting. Uh, Rotengen, I always always think it's uh, it's funny. Um, the first picture he allegedly took was his wife's hand, and uh, he this drawing actually does not have a depiction of his wife's hand. Uh, but he actually took a picture uh, of his wife's hand, and I can almost imagine that uh, being a weird conversation in the Rotengen house. Hey, honey, I, I have these uh, kind of strange rays I am uh, making here, and this is an early cathode ray tube, actually. And uh, so we have the cathode and the anode, 
um, the x-rays will be emitted um, from the uh, target metal and uh, they will um, um, be characteristic uh, based upon what the, the metal is made out of. And uh, we use x-ray analysis um, in scanning electron microscopy and it's EDS results basically. And we'll talk about that later when we get to SEM. Uh, but here's a depiction. So it was basically an early cathode ray tube and uh, you emitted x-rays. And then this was, I'm um, assuming photographic paper, it says photographic plate and uh, this Crookes tube, um, which was an early vacuum tube. And uh, so had a, an electron gun um, assuming it hit the target here and the x-rays were emitted and uh, formed a photograph. Um, I typically go through this because it's very fascinating to me of uh, how people used radiographs and how people use these newly discovered rays. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more at length, but x-rays are a result of the electron uh, material interaction. And uh, so you can actually generate um, x-rays also from photons as well. Um, but in this case, this was an electron material interaction. And uh, so these energetic electrons go in, there's a reaction by the material and an x-ray is emitted. And we'll see this a little bit more uh, later on in this lecture. I'm kind of digressing a little bit. So history, okay. So this was, I believe 1912 when this radiograph of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, Actually, no, this is Teddy Roosevelt, not FDR. This is Teddy Roosevelt because he was running for office again as part of the Bull Moose Party. And uh, so he'd already been president. He was trying to be president again. And uh, I wanted to say it was a gentleman from Austria tried to kill him, tried to assassinate him at a um, um, rally he was holding. I believe it was in Wisconsin. And uh, t the story goes uh, with Teddy Roosevelt, he was shot and he kept going. He, uh, he kept going on with his speech even after the assassin or would-be assassin uh, was apprehended. Uh, Roosevelt survived this assassination attempt, but he was not re-elected um, through the Bull Moose Party. And uh, you can see the bullet is highlighted here. Um, I guess this is highlighting aspects of, of uh, his rib cage structure, but this was an X-ray radiograph. And so this is 1912. And if you go back and look, Rotengen discovered x-rays in 1895. So it wasn't very long after that uh, people were using this as a diagnostic tool. Um, I almost want to venture to guess that the x-rays did him more damage than the bullet, but I don't want to go too far and say that, but I'm guessing that is the case. Um, if you look, here's a uh, an x-ray radiograph of Rotengen's wife's hand. So this is allegedly the first radiograph or first image ever made uh, with an x-ray. And then she had a quite a large ring. So maybe that was um, kind of the exchange or something. Hey, uh, stick your hand in this and I'll give you a ring. I, I don't know. Again, strange conversations must have happened. Um, so very quickly, people were using this as a means to um, diagnose people or um, if that's the right word, uh, look at this gentleman's bullet. Um, Teddy Roosevelt's bullet. Um, other people had interesting ideas, and so I always uh, shudder at this. And I've gotten all this from this this link this link below for National Geographic. Um, so X-ray exposure. So using um, X-rays to cure headaches, and uh, so they had a headache machine. And uh, I kind of always marvel at this. I, I look at this at least once a year. And, uh, you know, the demons in his head causing his headaches. And so they, they gave him x-ray exposure and relief in 15 minutes. So 15 minute of x radiation exposure to your head. I don't know. I don't, it doesn't seem like a good idea, but uh, this is how people were using it. Um, they also used x-rays for shoe size, shoe sizing machines. And I don't have a picture of that, but that sprung in my brain. I saw a documentary or one of those shows on Discovery Channel. Uh, where people refurbish old stuff. And one of the things they were refurbing was an old shoe sizing machine uh, that actually ran on x-rays. So you got an x-ray radio radiograph of the bone structure of your foot to make shoes. And uh, I, I, again, don't necessarily think that's the best idea, but this is what people were doing. And I don't have a year on this one. And uh, so I, I might want to look it up, but it was a long time ago. Uh, if 25 cents, eight doses, 25 cents. Pretty interesting. 
um, people were also using X radiation in light sources, supposedly, and they thought it gave uh, softer light. And I kind of think it's crazy. It's engineering lighting. And uh, again, interesting use for X rays. Don't recommend it um, because uh, X radiation can be kind of harmful to humans. And uh, anyway, going through the history, taking a look at uh, what, what thing, kind of crazy things, I think these are kind of crazy things uh, people did with x-rays uh, soon after they were discovered. I don't imagine this was quite new, and I wish I had the year for this. Um, I know that Teddy Roosevelt was 1912 because I'm, I'm familiar with that story, but uh, anywho. What is an x-ray? So an x-ray is electromagnetic radiation, so what else is electromagnetic radiation? Uh, visible light and radio waves are also electromagnetic radiation. And uh, so gamma rays and x-rays are on the angstrom or, or a fraction of an angstrom level. Um, we have, can have this UV light, so run the 300 nanometer range, visible light, 700 nanometer, uh, microwaves, one centimeter, radio waves can uh, be as long as the kilometer. Um, in terms of wavelength, and uh, they have different energies. So shorter wavelength yields higher energy, and I need to insert a problem um, kind of talking about that. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, so this one I'm going to show you is a little bit better than uh, my poor depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, here's an example of the electromagnetic spectrum, and I, I believe I got this from hyperphysics. Um, I did not cite it on this, so I'm, I'm kind of committing a, a small crime. Hyperphysics is where I think I got this. I did not make this up. Um, so different things again. So this is kind of depicted going the opposite way of this graph. So this graph I have smaller on the left, bigger on the right. Uh, this one, it's bigger on the left, smaller on the right. And a shorter wavelength, higher energy. So I, I like... Uh, I like this, actually, because the higher energy is going this way. So that's probably why they inversed it. Um, then longer wavelength is uh, lower lower energy. And uh, we can calculate all this based on Planck's law. And uh, we'll get to that um, in time. Uh, copper K alpha, so my handy dandy um, animation there kind of shows us where we're living in terms of our x-ray diffractometer, uh, the two we actually have on campus at UTEP, uh, copper K alpha is a 1.54 angstroms. And so it's kind of in this range here and it's the beginning of hard x-rays. And so there is some uh, shielding involved in uh, the instrumentation we have um, on campus. Um, so the energy of a photon, so promised I'd get to it, got to it pretty quickly is, uh, this is, uh, I believe this is Planck's law. Um, e equals Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. And uh, so we have two different uh, constants here, or two different um, values for Planck's law. One is in joule seconds, so joule times second. Uh, we deal primarily with electron volts second in this class. So um, this was the number used in Stranger Things, and actually uh, they went a little further on in terms of significant figures. So very impressive. Thank you, Stranger Things. Um, anyway, so 6 by 6 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times second, or 4.135 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volts times second. Uh, mu here is the, is this mu? I believe the V looking thing is frequency. Uh, C is the speed of light, so 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, kind of rounding a little bit. And um, you can substitute frequency. Um, so frequency is the speed of light over lambda. It's a photon, so we know it's traveling the speed of light. That's why we can make this substitution. And so we can substitute E equals HC over lambda to uh, calculate. We can go between the energy of a photon and the wavelength of a photon uh, using this equation. And uh, this reduces down to roughly 12.4. If we're using angstroms for wavelength and um, kilo electron volts for energy, I had to kind of think about that. I think I have it. I do have it. Um, so these are the units that are applicable to this class. I kind of messed up my highlighting and uh, this relationship is going to be seen again. So E equals HC over Lambda. So think about it. So FM radio is in the uh, range of megahertz 
and so it's a 10 to the 6 hertz and a hertz is 1 over second so uh, don't forget that unit conversion and x-rays are 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 19 hertz and uh, so if we see a direct proportionality between um, frequency and energy uh, you can tell right away 10 to the 6 versus 10 to the 16 um, these um, higher frequency shorter wavelength uh, um, waves are going to have much much more energy um, so again reduces to 12.4 over lambda where the units of length are angstroms and the energy is kilo electron volts so you could easily go back and forth uh, between energy and wavelength and um, you can convert frequency so 10 time, 10 to the 6 hertz um, you can, can go from frequency to wavelength quite easily and uh, so little things to remember I would I would recommend kind of committing this stuff to memory um, electron material interactions uh, so again um, you get secondary electrons backscattered electrons OJ electrons so we've talked about OJ electrons already uh, we'll talk about secondary and backscattered electrons at length uh, when we talk about scanning electron microscopy. Um, X-rays are another uh, result of the electron material interaction and uh, light fluorescence. You can actually get fluorescence from um, hitting the material with an electron beam. But one thing to point out is 99% of the kinetic energy of this incoming electron okay, is converted to heat. And uh, so again, if you look at the additive manufacturing methodology of electron beam melting, that's using an electron beam to melt the metal. And uh, the reason it can do that is because 99% of the kinetic energy is actually converted to heat. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about accelerating voltages, um, but I'll kind of just foreshadow a little bit. The accelerating voltage of an X-ray generator in an X-ray diffractometer is on the same order as uh, the accelerating voltage of electrons in an electron beam melter. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, we can rewrite our classical uh, kinetic energy equation in terms of electron volts, because uh, we know that electron volts is a form of energy. Um, An electron volt is the elementary charge. So 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times the applied voltage. And if you recall that a volt is a joule per coulomb, you'll see how the um, units cancel out. M equals one half mv squared. So these accelerated electrons have a velocity um, that gives rise to an energy, but 99% of that kinetic energy is converted to heat. And uh, you should remember stuff like the elementary charge. Um, so just kind of putting that out there. X-rays, yay. All right, so generation of X-rays, this is my painstakingly drawn uh, version of an X-ray tube and took a long time. Um, in X-ray generators, X-ray generators, excuse me, X-ray generators, getting tongue-tied today. Um, it's thermionic emission uh, that emits the electrons that hit the target material. And uh, this target material in an X-ray diffractometer, uh, typically copper or cobalt. And uh, copper is uh, pretty common. Cobalt is used mainly for ferrous uh, X-ray diffractometry. Although we always buck what everyone else says and we do ferrous uh, material characterization with our copper-based X-ray diffractometer, um, there's a reason why you don't typically want to use copper as a target. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But your filament, it's heat up, it emits electrons. Those electrons have a kinetic energy, hits the target. Uh, the electron material interaction, one of the interactions is an X-ray. And uh, that X-ray is directed out through this window. Um, this is an evacuated vacuum tube, so you have to have something that X-rays can easily pass through. Uh, beryllium is, is pretty much the most common, even though it's toxic, so you don't want to touch beryllium. Um, but beryllium is, is pretty much the most common. It's, it's the lightest uh, material that you can get that's a solid um, and pretty stable at, at room temperature. And so the x-rays pass through and they hit your sample. And uh, so this is my painstakingly drawn uh, version of an x-ray tube. Uh, we have better ones. So I got this one from Hyperphysics. And uh, these, these uh, individuals are saying that uh, a copper rod is used for heat dissipation. Um, if you actually look at our uh, Bruker X-ray diffractometer, um, it's cooled by water. 
And also uh, the small Rigaku we have is also water cooled um, because you could actually melt the target with your, uh, with your electron beam. And so this shows a copper rod. We actually have water cooled tubes. And again, filament emits electrons, thermionic emission, pretty much what I said in the last slide. Uh, these electrons hit the target. The electron material interaction uh, leads to the generation of photons and um, high voltage. Uh, we're about 40 kilovolts on our X-ray diffractometer. Um, trusting my memory on that one. Um, so kind of some text and I'll go ahead and read it out to you. So X-rays are produced whenever high speed electrons collide with a metal target. X-ray tubes are a source of electrons, um, and I don't, I hesitate to use the word source there um, because an X-ray tube is actually an X-ray generator. It's not an X-ray source. So a source means it's on all the time. So a radioactive source uh, means like plutonium or something like that that's, that's always hot, if you will. An X-ray generator, you have to turn it on. So it's a radiation generator. Um, so the tubes are the source of the electrons. They're accelerated with a high accelerating voltage. They hit a metal target. Um, we know most of the kinetic energy of the electrons is converted to heat in the target. And uh, so almost always water cooled. I, I'm curious why they had this copper rod thing. Uh, there's two basic types of X-ray tubes. And um, so gas tubes, you ionize a small quantity of gas. And I've, I've never actually seen one uh, in person. Um, filament tubes are the most uh, common, and so the source of the electrons is a, is a hot filament for thermionic emission. Um, here is a old version of an X-ray tube. They don't look quite like this anymore. Um, here is a, an X-ray tube. Um, this is provided by Cullity. So if you want to read about X-ray diffractometry, excuse me. B.D. Cullity um, wrote the, I guess, seminal work on um, X-ray diffraction. And a lot of these figures are actually replicated in uh, the Branded and Kaplan textbook for class. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, but this is more akin to what a X-ray tube looks like nowadays, even though this is from 1956. Um, they're not necessarily glass anymore, like this uh, depiction here, but they still look pretty much the same. And I don't have the one I show uh, on campus in my house for a lot of reasons, uh, mostly because I don't want to have a beryllium window in my house. Um, but usually I show it in class. We've sealed off the beryllium, so it's not uh, a contamination risk to people. Uh, but it's good to see the tube. They're, they're actually quite large. Um, my pet peeve, no dimensional reference. So it's kind of hard to get an idea of how big they are. Uh, but they're roughly the size of a large, uh, like coffee cup that you take to in your car, like an insulated coffee cup. Anyway, again, um, thermionic emission, electron generator, metal target. This time it shows the cooling water, cooling the target and uh, the x-rays pass through. And, uh, so they have different windows because different instrumentation have, uh, different configurations. And uh, so you can use the same x-ray tube on different instruments. And so it helps x-ray tube manufacturers save money because they don't only have to create a certain number of x-ray tube models. Uh, the x-ray diffraction uh, manufacturers, the diffract diffractometer manufacturers have to not copy each other's technology so they can reconfigure their instrument so they don't um, infringe on patents by another company. So Panalytical is one and Bruker is another, even though I think Bruker was recently bought out by uh, Thermo Fisher. But anywho, um, they want to have kind of their own protected intellectual property and stuff like that. But you can use different x-ray tubes potentially on different instrumentation um, because of the configuration of the windows and that kind of thing. Um, again, same thing again. And um, just showing, uh, it's pretty much the same thing, I believe. And this one's actually showing the x-ray generator. Oh, this is a gas x-ray tube. Man, read your own caption. Um, so here's a gas x-ray tube, excuse me, where you uh, have a cathode, you have a gas. Um, it's not thermionic emission. You're ionizing the gas in this tube 
and the electrons are hitting the target and the electrons are forming um, as a result of this of this cathode being present there and energized excuse me how embarrassing um, we won't go there okay so characteristics of common anode materials and so chromium iron cobalt copper and molybdenum are, are common anode materials um, used not necessarily in uh, x-ray diffraction but for all types of uh, x-ray analysis um, however you can use these in uh, x-ray diffraction um, there's some advantages and disadvantages to them and so you see the different accelerating voltages in terms of kilovolts so copper you know roughly 45 kilovolts is the optimal accelerating voltage for that tube um, you have uh, copper k alpha 1.54 angstroms uh, there's a k alpha 1 and k alpha 2 oftentimes uh, you can't discern the difference between k alpha 1 and k alpha 2 so the uh, average is reported basically um, but some advantages and disadvantages and uh, so high resolution uh, for large despacings and also for the diffraction of organic materials so that's actually pretty good if you're working with organic materials um, a disadvantage it attenuates a lot in air and attenuate means you're basically just losing amplitude um, when you pass through something and we'll talk more about attenuation uh, before this lecture uh, our group of lectures is over um, iron and uh, so you can use an iron target um, and uh, you can actually use it to characterize iron and uh, but you, it fluoresces if you're looking at chrome so fluorescence is a problem and what fluorescence does is you're creating visible photons uh, due, the, due to the excitation and de-excitation and that's a different mechanism than diffraction and so what you can basically do is add noise to the system because of fluorescence uh, cobalt if you look at uh, most uh, steel based research laboratories they use cobalt based um, x-ray diffractometers and um, a shorter wavelength uh, than an iron uh, basically and uh, so that gives you a better resolvable despacing so cobalt is a better uh, target um, than iron actually i believe anyway um, for uh, iron rich materials such as steels uh, copper is uh, is very common and um, it's kind of the workhorse target uh, but it uh, fluoresces um, iron and actually uh, cobalt and uh, so if you're looking at cobalt and iron based uh, materials you don't you typically don't want to use copper even though we use it all the time um, you can also look through a lot of the literature that's been published by utep and we're actually pretty successful and uh, molybdenum uh, has a short wavelength and uh, so it's good for for small unit cells um, so short wavelength it's 0.7 so it's roughly half of that of copper and so the kind of keep this in mind the smaller the wavelength the smaller the despacing uh, you can resolve um, again so different uh, materials uh, different pros and cons uh, different wavelengths so different uh, characteristics of, uh, of uh, diffractometer basically um, the continuous spectrum and we see the continuous spectrum when we look in an EDS spectra um, typically when we're doing EDS we're looking at materials that have a lot more than one element um, when we look at the continuous spectrum for a target material we only expect to see one characteristic peak and uh, what's a characteristic peak well let's keep looking um, x-rays uh, are produced whenever matter is irradiated with a beam of high energy charged particles or photons um, in an x-ray tube the interactions um, are between the electrons and the target and so since energy must be conserved the uh, energy loss from the interaction results in the release of x-ray photons so it kind of makes sense and we'll see this depicted a little bit better you're bombarding material uh, with electrons we've kind of seen what happens with the generation of an OJ electron there's all this business going on in the lower levels an OJ electron freaks out and leaves um, however when an, an upper electron comes to fill the lower shell um, there is a net energy change basically so photons must be released in this case x-ray photons 
Um, the uh, <clears throat> wavelength of energy will be pretty much equal to the energy loss or proportional to the energy loss. And uh, the process generates a broad band of continuous uh, radiation. Uh, Bremstrahlung or white radiation is what it's called. It's also called breaking radiation. And if you want to visualize Bremstrahlung, if you look at an EDS spectra, and I know I don't have a picture of this, I'm kind of, again, random. Um, if you look at the noise on an EDS spectrum, basically, that's Bremstrahlung. Um, if you look here, here is a kind of a depiction of characteristic peaks. Uh, you have K alpha, K beta. Uh, K beta is actually shorter wavelength, so it's higher energy, but it's less intensity than K alpha. Um, so that's why we use K alpha as uh, sources for X-ray diffraction because the intensity is higher. Um, the Brentford-on continuum is everything else that's not the continuous or character, sorry, not the characteristic peak. And uh, so this is molybdenum. Um, this target was irradiated at 35 kilovolts, and that's when you start to actually see characteristic peaks. You don't see characteristic peaks at every accelerating voltage, okay? And uh, that's very important. And uh, we'll talk about how this limits EDS characterization later. Um, but Bremsstrahlung continuum is pretty much everything else. Um, the X-ray spectrum, um, there's a minimum voltage required to generate a characteristic X-ray. And uh, so you can kind of substitute voltage for EV here, um, but it's still the same relationship. So it's lambda equals 12.4 over voltage. Uh, but what this does is it tells you what accelerating voltage you need in your tube to generate the uh, required uh, um, X-ray basically. And uh, so short wavelength limit, that's where it all begins where you start getting Bremstrahlung or the breaking um, radiation. And uh, so the X-ray generation, all right. So we're talking about the generation of X-rays and here we're focusing mainly on, on K radiation because that's the radiation we use in uh, X-ray diffraction. And uh, you've seen these depictions uh, earlier when we were talking about, um, I believe X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and uh, these earlier um, discussions on spectroscopy we've had in this class. And uh, so kind of forgive it. Um, this isn't quite correct. Usually you, we know that there's a plurality to the levels in these L, M, N, uh, but for the sake of depiction, um, I've depicted it as um, one level. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an electron comes from the electron beam uh, in the X-ray generator. Uh, this electron uh, then knocks a K-level electron out. Um, this knocked out electron incidentally uh, becomes secondary, a secondary electron. It's what we use to image or one of the flavors of electrons we use to image in a scanning electron microscopy. But we'll talk about that later. Um, an electron from an upper level falls and takes its place. And the conservation of energy pretty much dictates that an X-ray be generated. And um, so some terminology here that we want to talk about. So if it came from one level higher, um, it's a K alpha uh, radiation. If it came from two levels higher, it's K beta. And if it came from three levels higher, um, it's a K gamma. Okay, and so K, K, the change in energy from the net change in energy from here to here is greater than from here to here. Okay, so if you can visualize that. So you increase in energy going from alpha to gamma, but you decrease in energy going from alpha to, or intensity going from alpha to gamma. And think about why. Why do we decrease in intensity? Okay, well, what are the odds? It's, a, it's all a game of statistics. So if I knock this electron out, the odds are greater than an electron from the neighboring shell is actually going to fill it. Okay, so the odds are much less that you're going to get a K beta, and the odds are even lesser still that you're going to get a K gamma. Okay, so we're getting more energy from K beta, K gamma, and I don't know if you saw that because I can't see when I record, if, just kind of letting you in. Um, so the energy difference between alpha and uh, this shell, or the, the K alpha level and this one, 
is smaller than k gamma in this one, but the odds of it falling from this shell are higher than these upper shells. And just kind of looking at it, hopefully you visualize it. It's going to be more likely that the electron that comes and fills this shell is going to be the neighboring shell. That's why the intensity of k beta and k gamma is so much less. And uh, we have kind of the depiction of a k alpha x-ray here because it's generated from this immediate interaction between this k shell and the immediate l shell. And uh, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, this is kind of another way of, of looking at it. I don't know where I got this. I feel kind of horrible putting it here without uh, citing the source. I dare say I got it from hyperphysics. Um, it's a pretty good, uh, I guess, a source for that kind of thing. So I, I kind of like my depiction a little better, actually. So you knock an electron out of the K shell. Um, if it falls from this neighboring shell, it's a K alpha X-ray. If it call, falls from the even higher shell, it's a K beta X-ray. Um, just to kind of satisfy, um, and we can read this, an incoming high energy photoelectron just lodges a K shell electron. If it, I don't, I don't know, I kind of like my, my depiction better. Just read it, if you will. All right, so L shell to K shell jump produces K alpha, M shell to K shell jump produces K beta. Hopefully, between these two, you get it. I have this one because um, I only talk about K gamma but for bigger, bigger atoms, you can even get a, a K delta. And it's kind of the same type of, uh, of phenomena happening, happening. And I for sure got this one from hyperphysics. Um, this is kind of a redepiction of, uh, and I kind of took some deep breaths there staring at all this it looks kind of i don't know for whatever reason i think of the matrix even i don't know why uh, but the highest energy is is k k radiation basically so um, you can get radiation generated by uh, l and m and if you go back to our original depiction if we lot if we knock an l level atom out and an electron from here comes and fills it, that's L radiation. But the net difference is much less than that that created the K radiation, okay? You can see that with this kind of band diagram type of uh, representation. Uh, looking at this, sorry, uh, looking at this, this is kind of a band diagram-esque uh, type of uh, depiction, but it's inverted really. But this is just sh showing that K radiation is the highest L is the second highest and M is the least highest. Um, you typically deal with L and M radiation in uh, electron, electron dispersive spectroscopy or EDS, uh, but we're dealing with K alpha, it's the most energetic. Um, longer wavelengths are too easily absorbed by your material, so you're not gonna have diffraction, you're gonna have absorption. Uh, remember that X-rays are photons, so some of these, um, I guess terminologies we talked about when we were talking about uh, the interaction of light with matter still applies. So you have transmission, you have diffraction, absorption, and that kind of thing. Uh, but these lower energy uh, wavelengths typically do not diffract in uh, materials like metals. Um, kind of again, depicting the same thing, the higher atomic number yields more energetic radiation and so we kind of saw that you even get K delta if you have a bigger atom, uh, basically. Uh, but the energy associated uh, with those K is also going to be higher um, for a higher Z uh, material. Um, so molybdenum, the, uh, again, for X-ray diffraction, the uh, strongest lines used are, are K lines. And uh, we're kind of seeing this depiction again. I've kind of explained it a little bit uh, that the K beta is actually a higher energy, but less intensity. Um, you, we have these kind of K alpha one, K alpha two, and uh, we, we typically can't resolve both um, on a spectra um, because the difference is so darn uh, minute. And so here K alpha one is 0.709, K alpha two is 0.714. Um, 
this is known as the K-alpha doublet, and it expresses the rated average um, in, of the two in favor of K-alpha one. And the weighted average, uh, you typically multiply K-alpha one times two, um, add these two together, so K-alpha one and K-alpha two together, then divide it by three. Um, that's, the, that's the weighted average. And I should probably write something out for that. Um, again, talking about an x-ray tube, um, I put a gas tube in here, uh, but you have to have an accelerating voltage um, even with the gas tube applied. And so I'm doing this to remind you that there is a device that you're putting a voltage to. And uh, to kind of help explain this, um, to kind of help explain this uh, graph a little bit better. So if my accelerating voltage is five, I start getting some Bremsstrahlung, but I don't get characteristic peaks. And the same is true for 10, 15, and even 20 kilovolts. Okay, so in the case of molybdenum, uh, when I get to 25 kilovolts, I start seeing these characteristic peaks. Okay, so there's a, a critical accelerating voltage that you need um, to actually see the characteristic peaks in your continuous spectrum. Otherwise, you just get noise. Okay, so I would ask you the question, I have uh, a tube that has a molybdenum target, but I only have a power supply that can supply 20 kilovolts. Can I use this for X-ray diffraction? The answer would be no, because I wouldn't get characteristic peaks. You see what I mean? Only at 25 kilovolts do I get characteristic peaks here. So bear that in mind, there, this kind of relates directly to the operating conditions of your X-ray diffractometer. So if you run it at too low of an, and you can change the accelerating voltage to your tube on these instruments, it's not a set thing. So if you operate at too low of an accelerating voltage, you won't be able to perform diffraction. That's very important. Um, the beam also has to be monochromatic. And we'll talk about this uh, in detail as the lectures go on. You have to filter out K-beta. You only want to perform diffraction with K-alpha. Uh, why? Well, that'll become more clear, but you'd get a lot of peaks you don't really understand how to characterize. Um, target material, again, you've seen this slide before when we talked about uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. Uh, the target material uh, tends to depend on the application and uh, so that other chart we saw was pretty much for X-ray diffraction. Um, so copper and cobalt, much higher energy uh, than magnesium and aluminum, uh, which is what you would use for X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And uh, so higher energy. So you need a, a good high energy to perform diffraction. And uh, we've talked about this a bit before. Um, I think we went through the conversion from wavelength to energy in that previous lecture. So if you're interested in uh, figuring out the wavelength of all of this, you can use the uh, E equals 12.4 over lambda, kind of a reduction of E equals HC over lambda, or you can go back and look at the old lecture for your reference. Um, so this is a good place to stop for now. Uh, we've talked a bit about a uh, background of, of x-rays. Uh, later on um, in the subsequent lectures, uh, we'll talk about um, creating a filter to filter out K beta. And uh, we'll talk about specifically the application of X-ray diffractometry. As always, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Thank you very much. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.